Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more Hemisync podcasts, such as Episode 8 with Dean Radin, podcasts that aren't necessarily associated with any particular Hemisync product, but simply feature fascinating guests and subjects associated with the frontiers of consciousness research and understanding, please consider joining our exclusive Patreon page and get some great discounts on Hemisync products in the bargain. Thanks for watching. Hail hearty listeners. We're joined today by Tom Campbell, the one and only. Um, so most people know Tom now as the author of My Big Toe, uh, influential lecturer, speaker, teacher on the nature of reality. Um, what I don't think everyone knows is that your roots kind of trace back to the early days of TMI and to the creation of uh, the creation of uh, Hemisync itself, along with Bob Monroe and Dennis Menerich. Um, and so it seems especially appropriate today that we're talking to each other and talking about this stuff as it's Bob's birthday. It's his 104th birthday. Um, that's kind of an homage to Bob. But um, so when he started working with Bob and Dennis kind of back in the lab, that was not your first introduction to meditation, right? So I mean, you'd, you'd already been a TM practitioner for quite some time at that point, right? Yes, I had been a TM practitioner for probably three years or so Okay. Uh, bef before then. And before that, uh, back when I was somewhere between five and seven years old, in that time frame, I was also uh, doing out of body and uh, uh, had uh, some entities that would come talk with me. So what I guess you'd call that non-physical friends. So I had some uh -huh. of that going on, you know, when I was very young. Uh -huh. And then, and then that stopped, and then uh, I got into TM when I was in graduate school, and um, that created a very uh, kind of profound moment in my life because I realized that I could debug my software because as a graduate student I'm doing research and research always requires computers and and uh, software and in those days it was you know punch cards. And, uh, you know, a computer that had a whole uh, uh, megabyte was uh, exceptionally huge. Mm -hmm. By our standards, that's pretty small. But um, it was very hard to debug in those days. You know, with it, uh, you didn't have the kind of tools for debugging that we have now. So it was a very yeah. tedious and difficult process. And at the computer that I worked at at the university, you only got one or two chances a week to run your job because it was mm -hmm. just this one computer that worked for the whole university. So if you made a mistake and it, you're, you'd bombed, you only get to do that twice a week. So, yeah. so you, you know, if you had a hundred errors, you know, it might take you a long, long time to debug it. So you, people in those days spent hours and hours, days, weeks on the debugging before they ever took it there because it was just more profitable that way. So here I was able to debug this code. And uh, the debugging wasn't always because there was a, a logical error in the code. Sometimes just the, the key punch was a little off center, mm. you know, that sort of thing. So it wasn't anything by looking at the line that you'd tell. But uh, if the key punch was off center, I, that little line would light up. And if I couldn't find anything uh, technically wrong with it, then I'd check its, its alignment. And sure enough, you know, there would be a problem there. So anyway, that was my first uh, time that my reality got jolted into something bigger mm -hmm. since I had been five to seven years old, you know, uh, playing without a body. Mm -hmm. um, that was so big just, for me. Yeah. So just in kind of tracking um, the evolution of your own thinking on the nature of reality and given your unusual background in kind of naturally occurring altered states, meditation and education and interest in physics, was were you kind of always an idealist? Were you a materialist at one point and was there an aha moment that kind of created this conversion or how did that uh, develop well um as a child i was uh um yeah i i'd say i guess i was an idealist i was uh you know i was the i was a kid that if we were on a long trip i'd sit in the car and chant uh -huh. you know so, so that i just zone out and then uh you know it seemed to me like 15 minutes later we were there even mm -hmm. though hours had gone by. So I tended to be like that. Like I say, I had non-physical friends. I was a very right brain, uh, very intuitive, um, 
no, lived in a big picture and not in a little picture. So I was kind of far away from materialism. Mm -hmm. But I had this knowledge that science was where I had to go, though I was very right brained and science and math were not easy. They were a struggle for me. Oh, that, that wasn't my normal way of thinking. Oh. But I worked at it and worked at it. And eventually I got good at it and it got easier and easier. And by the time I started meditating, when I was, uh, I guess it would have been, uh, you know, middle, middle of late 20s, when I when I started TM, the thing I just told you about the uh, mm -hmm. debugging code, um, I had come to the opinion, pretty much like all the other physicists did, and that reality was um, something you could measure. If you couldn't measure it, it either didn't exist, or it was irrelevant. Mm -hmm. That's so if you can't measure it, then it isn't real was kind yeah. of the idea. Only measurable things were real things. Yeah. So that um, that was my idea. What reality was. And then I started the, de, uh, you know, debugging programs in my mind and it haven't actually worked. Well, that wasn't something that could be measured. That yeah. was something that was entirely mental. And when that that's why that hit me hard, because that then opened my reality at that point, And I'm. At that time, maybe 20, you know, five, mid 20s, I guess. And that hit me and made me think, well, there's another whole dimension to reality that yeah. can be measured. And the measured part is just a subset of a bigger reality. Yeah. So I understood that then at my, at my mid 20s. And that was probably about three years before I went out to Bob Monroe's for the first time. Okay. And so then when you're kind of starting to work with Bob, so now you're, you know, in a lab environment, but you're exploring consciousness. And so there are some things that are quantifiable and that can be measured, whether it's skin temperature or EEG brain waves. Yeah. Um, and so now you're kind of getting a synthesis of the two. Um, is that where it sort of starts to really click for you that, hey, maybe there's some type of a, an overarching theory that can explain how these things can marry? Well, that was my idea, to see if I yeah. could find some overarching theory of how all these things work together. Yeah. Um, my idea was, and, and very shortly after spending, you know, we spent like 15 to 20 hours a week with Bob. Yeah. So it's just like another job, just about. You know, it was a half-time job that we had uh, with him. And it wasn't very long after that that Dennis and I were both, you know, going out of body, pretty much on demand, that we were exploring uh, the larger conscious system. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be, because I'm a physicist, and what physicists do is model reality, I wanted a model that would have both worlds in it, because yeah. I could see that both worlds were real places, both had real information, both were valuable, but there was no link between them. So then I spent the next 35 years trying to figure out this model of something that could describe both and describe it well. Well, one of the things I learned at Bob right right away, Bob's right away, was that consciousness is fundamental. Mm -hmm. And consciousness had to be more fundamental because I could do things within consciousness that would alter things in the physical. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't do things in the physical that would fundamentally change, you know, the way consciousness worked. Uh -huh. you know, so it was all a one way, it was all a one way street. So uh -huh. consciousness had to be the superset, not uh -huh. the subset. So I knew that, that consciousness was the fundamental thing and that our physical reality somehow was a subset of that. Right. But, you know, somehow, for some reason, some way, you know, I had no idea exactly how that was. So what I did then after, this was probably after maybe five years with, with Bob and my ability to go out of body on demand and to do it in a, in a way that I could repeat the states and repeat, you know, what happened. So I would go do something like remote viewing or reading numbers off a board or healing or um, any, anything that was evidential. And then I would change a variable and do it again. Mm. And ch change, you know, do it not just again, but do it again and again and again, and then change another variable or change that variable a little more. So, so say, by, <laughs> by constantly experimenting on what changed what and what was you know, what was uh, upstream and downstream logically mm. from, from other parts, I was able to, in 35 years, put together some sense of a model 
of how it all worked, how you know how it was put together. Yeah. Uh, now this model of mine is just basically uh, it's metaphorical in the sense that it is it is a model. You know, I I don't claim a model is a fact or a law. It's just a model. And what I did is I found all the facts of consciousness that I had gleaned from my 35 years of doing research there. And I, I kind of wrote those down, you know, here, here, here's what I know about consciousness and how it works. And here's what I know about the physical world and how it works, which was another long list because I'm a physicist. Yeah. So I had those two and it's like, how can I put those together? Yeah. You know, knowing that the consciousness is the superset. So I started making this model up, and every time I had a piece of consciousness that was a fundamental piece of the logic that you know had to had to be there, then I'd give that a name, like larger consciousness system, or individuated unit of consciousness, or free will awareness unit. You know, we'll yeah. maybe talk about those later. But I just named all these functions. They're just basically functions, and if you if you don't name them, then you can't talk about them. You know, and yeah. we can't have discussions about them. So. And yeah. I, I wanted to make up names that had no previous baggage to them. So when we got to the fact, you know, to the to the logical necessity to have multiple lifetimes rather than reincarnation, I talked about mm -hmm. experience packets because yeah. I wanted to deconnect from anything that had, you know, baggage with it, emotional baggage or belong to this belief or that belief, because right. this had nothing to do with belief. So the no experience packet is a lifetime. Hmm? So the, the experience packet is the lifetime in this. It's the lifetime, but, yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So you have multiple experience packets, yeah. and that's the lifetime. Yeah. So I just I just wanted it to stay clean and logical all the way yeah. through. And I wanted it to have no extra parts that weren't necessary. Yeah. So like I have an IUOC, which is individuated unit of consciousness. Now that's the subset of the larger thing, and that's us. That's you and I basically. Uh -huh. But you know, and and what we do is we have these experiences in this virtual reality. And I called the part that did that a free will awareness unit. So I have these various things, but that's all they are. They're just labels for a log a necessary logical function in consciousness. Mm -hmm. That was part of my research. So that's the way the model's written. I don't go into Oh, this individuated unit of consciousness, that's the same as the higher self. And that does this and that yeah. exists on 14 levels and does A, B, C, and D. All yeah. of that isn't necessary. Yeah. See? Now you can you can go there and do that, but my research didn't show that any of that was necessary. So yeah. I don't get into any of that. It's just the IUOC period. Yeah. So, so I try to keep it as simple and direct as possible. So that's very interesting and also very Bob-like. So you guys both love the use of acronyms. Both, <laughs> both uh, love the use of terms that are kind of, you know, washed from any sort of dogma or sort of religious yes. overtones or very literal and explain exactly what it is and nothing more. Um, and so we're getting into my big toe now. And for those that aren't familiar with your work, we're not talking about the largest appendage on your foot. We're talking about this book that you put out in 2003. It's some 800 pages long. You can see this is my dog-eared copy. Um, so I first read this seven or eight years ago. And so this interview was kind of the culmination of these questions I've been saving up for you over the course of that time. Um, but um, so one of the terms that you threw out was largest conscious or was larger consciousness system or the LCS. Mm -hmm. And so kind of the fundamental underpinning of your theory really is that consciousness exists, the LCS ex exists to evolve and to lower entropy. Um, is, is that kind of a fair summation? I mean, yes, the yeah. larger consciousness system is just the fundamental consciousness, you know, that is consciousness. And what it does is it, it's evolving. It's not a fixed thing. It's not a perfect thing. It's not an infinite thing. It's a finite system that is conscious, is aware. And it has to evolve in order to maintain itself. You know, there's, yeah. there's only two choices. You evolve or you de-evolve. If you de-evolve, then eventually you go away. You disappear. Yeah. If you evolve, then you keep getting more and more functional, more, right. more, you know, better and better. And the LCS evolves by us evolving as individuals. By yes. 
by the individual choosing to improve the quality of his or her own consciousness. Yeah, well, that's part of its evolution. It can evolve by, you know, it has its own consciousness, its own, it, you know, it is aware. Mm -hmm. But, and it can evolve through its own choices. But one of its major strategies is as we evolve, it evolves because we are a part of it. So mm -hmm. we're just little subsets, and I call those the individuated units of consciousness. We're these little subsets of this bigger consciousness system. Mm -hmm. And so as we evolve, then it evolves. Mm -hmm. And so um, let's talk a bit about this idea of lowering entropy, because this kind of runs counter to um, what most materialist physicists kind of take to be the inevitable march towards higher entropy. And so the second law of thermodynamics is that any closed system must inevitably lead towards higher entropy, which means um, less organization, more chaos. Um, whereas um, your idea is that we must move towards lower entropy. Can we talk a bit about how that happens? Sure. Well, even in, uh, even in the physical world, uh, entropy can be lowered. Mm -hmm. It just, the average entropy of the universe uh, is always getting higher. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the second law of thermodynamics. But it doesn't mean that within a subsystem of that universe that the entropy can't be lowered. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, you know, when sperm meets egg and a, and a, and a new uh, you know, entity gets created here, there's a lot of growth there. You mm -hmm. know, you take something that's very simple to start with and you build something that's hugely complex, yeah. you know, in that process of uh, gestating a, a, an infant. Well, that is lowering entropy. There's lots more order and complexity there, and that infant can can progressively do more and more, mm -hmm. you know, which is the definition of entropy, basically. So that entropy is being lowered, but that's just a subsystem within the system. So what thermodynamics says is that the average entropy in the whole universe is continually getting higher. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say how fast that's happening, but it just, that's happening. Things are breaking down even though within the universe there's also little subsets where it's going the other way. If you have a salt solution and that salt solution begins to crystallize, well, those crystals are lower entropy. They're mm -hmm. more organized. You know? But what thermodynamics says is that if you're going to lower entropy, you have to put in work. You yeah. have to do something. It takes effort. You know, if, you haven't, if you're going to grow a baby, you have to feed it. You, know? you need nutrition. You need, you know, whatever, you know, the, you know, and the food comes basically gets a lot of nutrition from sunlight and all the chemical interactions that sunlight creates. And then we eat that and we pass that nutrition on. So you have to have input to basically run counter to the average flow. Right. And that requires effort. Well, with consciousness is a little different than the physical reality. Consciousness is aware. It's self-modifying. So it grows, it makes choices. So it's a self-modifying system. So it can put in effort to make better choices that produce lower entropy mm -hmm. in the system. So it can evolve itself just by making that, that effort. And we're like that. You mm -hmm. know, and if you think, if, you know, I, I call consciousness an information system. An information system is made out of bits. That's the smallest piece of information, a yes or a no, a one or a zero. Okay, now if all the bits are random, the system doesn't have any information. Random bits carry no information. If you order those bits, you lower the entropy of that information system. Okay, now if you not only order the bits, but make those bits mean something, you know, they become metaphors for something, or they become symbols for something, if they become uh, usable, so now we're talking about the, organi the organizing of the bits creates value for the information. Okay, that lowers the entropy. Mm -hmm. So entropy is used for lots of things. You know, and, and uh, you know, there, there's probably a dozen different flavors of entropy because it's a fundamental general concept that scientists use and apply it to various things. So they tweak it a little bit. But the fundamental concept is that Entropy is a measure of disorder. Yeah. Okay. So if you increase order, increase organization, that lowers entropy. Now, the other thing that defines entropy is that if you lower entropy, you increase the ability of that system to 
do work, to do something. So for an example, if you have a, you know, a jar of gasoline and you let the gasoline evaporate, well, you still have all those gasoline molecules somewhere. They're all in the atmosphere, you know, all banging around, but there's very high entropy there. There's no order to them. When they were a liquid, there was an order. They were all, you know, had certain properties and interacted with each other, but now they're gone. It's high entropy. Well, when they're spread all over the atmosphere like that, they can't do anything. Yeah. They've got no power. They've got no ability to affect anything, really. Whereas when you had a little jar of gasoline, while well, you had something that had a lot of power, something that if you threw a match in, you know, would uh, release a whole lot of energy. Yeah. So it's through the order you have a greater ability to work. So those are the two things that define entropy. Yeah. And I use those two things ex exactly. So in an information system, in order to create information, like I say, you have to order the bits in some way. And the order needs to mean something. Okay, so that's how you lower the entropy. And to raise the entropy, then you have to randomize the bits. Mm -hmm. Okay, now consciousness is a, is a thing. Well, let me give you just the definition of consciousness. Consciousness is awareness okay, that makes choices. It's a, it's a choice-making awareness. So I'm aware, and I'm aware of this, and I'm aware of that, and I choose this rather than that. You know, it's a, it's a thing that, that uh, makes choices. So that means it has free will, comes in with that, because you can't make choices if you don't have free will, because without free will, there are no choices. Yeah. Uh, also, time comes in with that, because make a choice, well, that was before, and now it's after I made the choice. You know, so there's things happening, and if anything happens now and then, you know, before and after, then time is there. So consciousness, free will, and time, all are logical things that have to coexist. For any of them to coexist, they all, you know, for any of them to exist, they all have to coexist. So I start my model with just an assumption that consciousness exists, mm -hmm. which isn't such a wild assumption since we all believe we're conscious, you know? Yeah. And we also believe that the dogs and cats and horses and bumblebees are conscious too, you know, they yeah, make choices. From a parsimony standpoint, you're doing pretty well here. That's a very basic, simple assumption that most yeah. people are going to concede. Yeah. Yeah. Well, most of my model is like that. It's very parsimonious. Yeah. It's very simple, and it doesn't get very complex, which makes it easy to understand. Yeah. Uh, but sure. anyway, so, so that's how consciousness evolves, by ordering its bits. And as it orders its bits, it can do more work. It mm -hmm. can accomplish more things. Okay. Just like in the baby is just a, you know, a sperm cell and an egg cell. And after a while, you've got a, a human being that can build a building. You know, yeah. it can do more things. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's value to the organization of the information. Mm -hmm. That lowers its entropy. Okay. Now, because it's a social system and it's interacting with consciousness, that's what consciousness does. It communicates with consciousness. In the beginning... It communicated with itself. It was just this one monolithic consciousness. Yeah. It it found that limiting. You know, there's only so much you can do when you're just interacting with yourself. You're kind of trapped by your own beliefs, if you will. It's hard to get outside of your own assumptions. So that's when it decided that in order to evolve, it would have to break itself into some pieces. And give those pieces free will. So it would just be subsets of itself, really. Now, yeah. I say break it into pieces. And in our mind, we see little chunks being broken off and set aside. But it's not necessarily like that. It's just subsets. Mm -hmm. it, it creates little subsets of itself and gives those subsets their own decision-making authority and lets them have free will and then lets them interact. Yeah. Okay? So they interact with each other. And what we have now is a much greater set of possibilities of what this system can do. Therefore, there's more choices. Therefore, there's more room for evolution, yeah. for expansion, for growth. But it's a social system. And in a social system, I can probably convince you in about 10 minutes that in a social system, the optimal configuration, by optimal, I mean the low, enter the low entropy configuration, where you have the most order, and the most productivity and the most value for the organization is when everyone in the social system cooperates, cares about each other, and is helpful to yeah. each other. If you have that, you know, they share resources. They 
help each other get along and do what they have to do. Each one is interested in, in helping everyone else. Yeah. The, that optimizes the social situation. Yeah. The opposite of that is fear. Mm -hmm. Fear is not about other. Fear is about self. What can I get? And if I get it, how can I keep it? And if somebody else has it, how can I take it away from them? You know, fear tends to be very self-centered. Yeah. Fear says no trust. If you're fearful, you can't trust anybody. Yeah. If you can't trust anybody, then it's all about number one. You know, it's all about you. It's a very self-centered place to be. So it's a very yeah. ego-driven space. So now those are the two opposites, fear and love. So we see if this system organizes toward love toward being helpful and courteous and kind and and you know compassionate those sorts of things then it's going to lower its entropy that's going to optimize ent entropy reduction and therefore it's going to evolve yeah. and if we de-evolve it's toward fear and self-centeredness because that's the very dysfunctional ways of organizing it's a dysfunctional organizational thing and a little logic. If you think about that, the logic will, you know, kind of verify that. Yes, fear is a very dysfunctional way to way to organize. It, uh, yeah. it's it chaos. doesn't. It's chaos. It doesn't go yeah. very far. Well, what happens yeah. if you have a fear-based society? What happens is that the the individual units of fear start to group up to be to find multi, you know, mutual defense packs. Yes. So other ones group up. That way, they can go to smaller to smaller groups and take away the stuff that the smaller groups have. So they can dominate the smaller groups and get bigger and bigger. And the bigger they get, the more invulnerable they are. So there's, it ends up eventually with you know, a, a number of large, powerful entities. Right. And they're very hierarchical. You've got the one on top, and then you've got the ones down. And it's all kind of a kick down, kiss up, you know, hierarchical yeah. organization. And those it's a dominator that, culture. Huh? Dominator culture as opposed to yes. like a, a caring, sharing, cooperative right. culture. And they dominate everything. So they yeah. each are trying to keep what they've got and take what others have. Yeah. That's, that's the basic thing. Well, that's yeah. where a fear-based social system goes. And that's just unstable. Yeah. It doesn't, you know, if somebody finds a new invention, they come up with a really great idea. Well, they don't share it. They keep it to themselves because, you know, good ideas might be good for them. They may work that into more money or more status or more power in the organization. So everything is got this self-centered bias to it, and that's very suboptimal. Or on the other side, yeah. somebody comes up with a new idea, and it's, hey, everybody, look, here's this better way of building houses, you know, and we can yeah. have a better house for half the price with this new idea, and it, it spreads, you know, openly. It's kind yeah. of an open, everything open source, right? It's one, it's one of those things. So yeah. anyway, that's how then this consciousness system that is evolving to lower its entropy that means what it's doing is it's evolving toward becoming love, toward cooperation yeah. and caring and that, that side of things. It's trying to get rid of the, the fear and the self-centered sort of right. things. So we're pieces of it. That means that's our mission as well, because right. that's really the only mission consciousness has is to evolve. Right. Because if it de-evolves, it ends up nothing. It's not even a consciousness system anymore. It's just a bunch of random ones and zeros. And so love is really kind of where you end up, um, yeah. which is interesting because that is also where a lot of the great wisdom traditions and religions wind up. It's where kind of a lot of, you know, new age stuff winds up and like a hardcore rationalist or, or materialist might not like that answer, right? Like, oh, you know, love, it's as simple as love or, you know, all you need is love. Like that, that, that kind of makes some folks feel uncomfortable. But you've basically gotten there through cold, hard logic, um, yeah. some deduction and a minimal set of assumptions. Um, exactly. And yeah. it actually even gets better because since consciousness is fundamental, then I knew that the physical world, our physical universe needed to be derived from consciousness. Mm -hmm. And if I keep this logic train going as you know, consciousness evolves, then I can logically show why our physical reality exists, you know, what its part is, that what it plays in this larger thing. Yeah. And I can see how our phys physical reality works. How is it yeah. being rendered? Now, the physical reality turns out to be just information because mm -hmm. consciousness is an information system. Yeah. So if consciousness is the source and, and the physical reality is the subset, then it's also 
just information. So there we have our physical realities of, of virtual reality. And f furthermore, I can also evolve science and physics because science has for the last hundred years been stuck in this problem of, you know, uh, what is what is real? What is this reality made of? You know, and they, they keep working on that particular problem. And yeah. where they have gone is materialism. Yeah, you know, it's a material world, and that never sat very well with me because I had plenty of experience that that really wasn't fundamental. You know, materialism is not a fundamental thing, and materialism is logically diametrically opposite to the consciousness, free will, time set of logic that has to all work together. Materialism and determinism go together. So, so if, you are, if you're a materialist, you have to be a determinist. Mm -hmm. If you're a determinist, you have to deny that time exists. Time is just an illusion. You have yep. to deny that consciousness exists. Consciousness is just an illusion. And you have to deny that free will exists. Free yep. will is just an illusion, you see? Whereas if you're on the other side with the consciousness time you see in free will, then you see materialism as a delusion yeah. and you see determinism as a delusion. Now, yeah. my, my uh, experience here says that time is real. Things go by, there's a before, there's an after. And that just makes good sense. My, yeah. my experience here says that I make choices. And sometimes I make bad choices, sometimes I make good choices, sometimes I make really uh, flaky choices, you know, without thinking about it too much. But they're my choices. And I have to deal with the consequences of those choices, whatever they are. So I feel like I have free will, and I feel like I'm aware. I communicate, and I communicate what I want to communicate. I'm in charge of what I think and what I say and who I say it to. Yeah. So all of my experience says that the consciousness, time, free will is a real thing, and that materialism and determinism are not real things. Yeah. And the double slit experiment back in the 1920s verified that that point was right. Because right. the double slit experiment said, no, materialism just doesn't work. You know, that experiment could not be explained by materialism. Matter of fact, it, that experiment said materialism is wrong. It doesn't so, work. Yeah. So let's uh, get into that for a bit, because not not all who are watching or listening might get what you're talking about. So the double slit experiment, and like I can very quickly get out of my depth with physics, so please feel free to send me back on track yeah. if I go off track. But the, the double slit experiment basically demonstrated that, um, you know, light behaves like a wave when it's not observed. And then when you observe it, it the wave function collapses and it becomes a particle. And so the observer um, basically impacts the physical reality of whether the photon is a wave or a particle. Um, and so that had, that kind of gave rise to, or gave fuel for the people that thought that consciousness was fundamental. Yes. Um, and the, the uh, physicists though, the materialists, they don't give up easily though, do they? So like in the subsequent decades, um, and again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but one of the alternative interpretations of the, of the double slit experiment is that, oh, well, okay, that particle, that, photon just collapsed into a particle in this one sort of branch of reality that we're inhabiting. And then in some other branch, you know, it's still a wave. So this gave rise to the uh, many uh, worlds or multiverse right. hypothesis, which is highly right. inflationary and eventually branches into like an infinite number of possible universes. Right. Right. Um, and what I think is interesting about your theory is that you also allow for the existence of multiple physical matter realities. And not just multiple physical matter realities, but also multiple non-physical matter realities, um, which does not seem on its face to be too dissimilar from the many worlds theory, even though you are fundamentally an idealist and the many worlds folks are generally trying to co-opt that understanding of reality into a right. materialist interpretation. I'm just curious how you would respond okay. to that. Sure, well, they're really very, very different, though they, mm -hmm. they end up with an ability to explain many of the same things. 
No. It's just that one one of the explanations is rational and the other one is not. <laughs> that's that's the difference. Uh -huh. And I should maybe not say it that way. I should say one of them is feasible. Well, that's how I react to it too, actually. Yeah. Yeah. One of them is 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 feasible. One yeah. of them is is reasonable to do, and the other one is, you know, almost from the from the view of parsimony, you know, it's almost ridiculous. Yes, that's the problem. <laughs> you see? So it, it's the difference between the two is if let's say you have this is just a, a, a an example, a comparison. If you had uh, two different ways of telling the weather, and one, you collect all the facts of, you know, where the rain is and where it's moving and, and the sources like we do now, where we have little, you know, weather stations all over the place. So we can say pretty much that next, you know, next week we're going to get some rain because the rain's been moving that direction at yeah. a certain speed, and we can kind of calculate when it's going to get here. So you have that theory of why it's going to rain, and then you have another theory that says, oh, it rains because the rain gods are angry. Yeah. Okay. Well, now both of those things come to conclusions that sound about the same. Well, they both predict the weather. <laughs> you know? It's just that one of them has logic and rationality behind it, and the other one is doesn't. Yeah. You see? Okay. So one of them is, is doable. All yeah. you need is a whole bunch of weather collection, you know, data collection centers. And the other one, what you need is outrageous assumptions. Yeah. You know, not not logical process. Yeah. Well that's the problem. You see Everything that many worlds can explain, my theory can explain as well. Yeah. But it explains it better. But my theory is doable. It's not mm -hmm. that hard to actually do it. Their yeah. theory has that every time, every time anything changes in the physical universe, and when I mean anything, I don't mean necessarily a sun explodes. I mean an electron goes from spin up to spin down in yeah. the universe. Anytime that happens, another universe is branched off. Okay. Right. Now, you've branched off that extra universe. Now, in either two of those universes where this electron flipped, if any electron flips, you have to branch off new yeah. universes. You see, and so on. Yeah. And pretty soon, what you said when you first introduced it, you end up with an infinite number of universes, or you end up with a, you know, 10 to the 6 million power, you know, you end up with some ridiculous size yeah. thing that continues to grow faster and faster because every time you get another one, then you have another one that's making changes, that's adding yeah. to the changes of all the rest of them. So it just, it blossoms, you know, yeah. mathematically just, just crazy. So something crazy. Yeah. yeah okay. well, so in the, in the, that. Given that a lot of electrons flip in the, un in our physical <laughs> universe, you know, in the first, you know, microsecond, you'd have trillions of trillions of trillions of trillions of trillions of trillions of universes. Yeah. And that's just just by the electrons flipping, which is silly, you right. see. So, yes, it is theoretically possible, theoretically possible that it's just all these universes, but it is practically impossible. You know, the practical sense of doing it yeah. is just ridiculous. Much easier but, to, to think that consciousness is fundamental. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the reason they're doing it is because they are trying to maintain the sense of it being material. Yes. And they're backed against the wall because the experiments say not. So yes. this is the trick that they can do to say, well, no, yeah, it's still physical. There's just, you know, trillion, trillion, trillion to the trillionth power of universes created every millisecond. Yeah. Uh, and that they're all physical. And that's why it stays physical. So. <laughs> That's like yeah. me saying, the, the, you know, the weather, the weather god's gotten angry. Uh, or sure, there are pink elephants that fly around at night. It's just that nobody can see them. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things. It not does, similar. Yeah, it's just not the simple approach. It's so complicated and so impossible that o Occam's razor yeah. basically just throws it in a trash pile with just a glance. You know, you don't have to study it too hard to realize that this is not science. This is so, wishful thinking. In terms of what is science, you're about to embark on another round of double slit experiments. You had a very successful Kickstarter campaign that raised the required funds, I think, in a single day. Um, and you've been spending a couple of years now getting these set up, right? What, yes. what, do, you, what do you expect these to show? Or okay. what's, what's different about these double slit experiments? OK, well, let me start at the top. Um, Double slit was the experiment that uh, 
changed everything as far as our worldview. That's when scientists found out that materialism didn't work. And what they found out is that when nobody was looking at which slit the particles went through, the particles rearranged themselves on the screen that they hit behind the slits in a diffraction pattern. Single particles. You see, materialism says what Newton said about particles is particles travel in a straight line unless they're interacted by some external force. Well, mm -hmm. there was no external force. They're particles, and they weren't traveling in a straight line. They rearranged themselves in a very particular pattern. Yeah. And materialism had no explanation of how that could possibly happen because material particles don't act like that. Yeah. You see? So that was where materialism got, you know, was science realized that materialism is a wrong answer. Yeah. And my model is basically a probabilistic model. My model of this physical universe is a probabilistic model, as are most um, virtual realities. A virtual reality typically is a deterministic core of rule sets, you know, basic things that happen, basic, uh, the, the basic rules of the virtual reality. Like if your character falls off a cliff, he'll get hurt. If you stay underwater too long, you'll drown. Uh, you know, uh, dogs can't fly, birds can, you know, things like that. Those are rules mm -hmm. that the, when you make a virtual reality, you can allow dogs to fly if you want, but if your rule says they can't, then they can. If it says they can, then they can. And the, the, the virtual reality support that. So you get this rule set, which is basically factual and deterministic. But on top of that, you have a, a um, probabilistic reality because the probabilistic reality is so much more efficient. You see, calculating a virtual reality from the ground up, you know, from the, you know, from the subatomic particles to the atomic particles, to the molecular, you know, to the molecules, trying to calculate a virtual reality from the ground up is almost as silly as the many worlds. It's mm. just too hard to do, too mm. much calculation. So that's not a, an intelligent way to make a virtual reality. So the virtual reality has to be a top-down probabilistic model. But the probability distributions that feed that model are made out of the rule set, which is the more deterministic part of it. Now, the rule set can have some random stuff in it as well, but it's mostly deterministic set of rules. So they're, they're probability models. So you see everything that many worlds gets, I get out of my probability model. Because in that probability, I can, I can say that there are probable futures, there is probable pasts, mm -hmm. you see, and many worlds gets to that by having all the various worlds, you know, out right. there. Well, I just have it in terms of probability. So they're not all generated. They're just mathematical. And it's you're building top down as opposed to bottom up. Right. Top down yeah. is the way most of the calculations go, and they're mostly probabilistic. And mm -hmm. from that viewpoint, getting to the quantum mechanics, I was able to derive quantum mechanics. I was able to have a logical description of why the double slit worked the way it did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, quantum mechanics says that double slit and quantum mechanics are just, you know, what do they say? Weird science. Yeah. It just doesn't make any sense. Even Feynman said that uh, I suspect no one will ever understand, you know, how quantum mechanics works. It's just one of those things that nature isn't going to show us. Well, that's nonsense. We're just looking at it from the wrong perspective. If you look at it from the perspective of virtual reality and, and probabilistic computed world, then the reason that those, those particles one at a time have to distribute themselves in a diffraction pattern on the screen is just logically derived. Okay, yeah, here's why they have to do that. So when I got to that point and I realized that I was able to derive a logical quantum mechanics, it wasn't weird science. Mm -hmm. so then I started, I looked at relativity and, oh, I could derive a relativity that also wasn't based on the weirdness of C being a constant, C mm -hmm. being the speed of light, always yeah. being a constant. So when I had those, I started looking then for some experiments, things that I could do to verify this approach. It's basically rederiving basic physics, our understanding of the world from a virtual reality perspective. Yeah. So that's really where it comes from. So I came up with some double slit experiments that will produce what I call some minor, mir minor miracles 
You know, mm. the fact that those particles distribute in themselves as a diffraction pattern, I call that a minor miracle. Yeah. You know, they're not supposed to do that. So by miracle, I just mean something happens that the materialistic science says can't happen. It's yeah. impossible, but it happens anyway. All right. So one of the things I want to do is basically solve a, a dispute that I have with some basic quantum mechanics assumptions. Uh -huh. So that's one thing. Quantum mechanics says it works this way. And I say, no, it doesn't. And those are the things around the observer. You know, mm -hmm. quantum mechanics has come to the point that nah, no observer is necessary. Mm -hmm. That uh, information is stored in a, in a, uh, uh, you know, in the, uh, in a, a uh, what's it called? An entangled pair or an okay. entangled things that, as the light entangles with the detectors. And, and I think all oh, that's nonsense. That doesn't make any straightforward sense. That's another one of those things like many worlds where you make it up just because it gives you the answer that you want. Yeah. Not because it really fundamentally makes any sense to, you know, to think about it that way. Uh -huh. So that's the first thing I want to do. But then after that, I've got some experiments that will, from the materialist point of view, the way they would look at it, it would allow an experimenter to predict the direction that a particle will come out of a radioactive nucleus. Now, when something's radioactive, that means that it spits out particles. Mm -hmm. you know, it spits out alpha particles or gamma rays or something. It's constantly mm -hmm. throwing these little particles out. And the particles always come out in some random direction. It's always random. There's, there's no pattern to the particles coming out. But in my experiment, I will be able to say, ah, the next particle that uh, comes out of that nucleus is going to come out over here oh. and predict it. And the prediction will be correct. And I'm going to be able to predict things like um, when light hits a, a device called a, uh, a beam splitter, what it is is a piece of glass or plastic that's treated such that any photon that hits it or any light that hits it has a 50-50 chance of going through it, transmitting through it, or reflecting from it. Yeah. Okay, and I, in one of my experiments, I'll be able to say, next photon to hit that is going to transmit. The mm -hmm. one after that is going to reflect. And all of those things are what I call minor miracles. In other words, making the experiment, just like the double slit, do yeah. something that uh, materialism says is impossible. Right. And to do that, then it changes. It, it's the double slit was able to be kind of, uh, ignored in the sense that we were talking about, um, you know, these tiny particles and we talking about them, them, uh, being a wave sometimes and being a particle sometimes, but this one's different. It's, it's harder to justify and to talk around the fact that I can predict how an atom's going to decay. That's impossible. Mm. What that's saying is that this physical world is decaying according to my observation. Yeah. The observation I make that forces it to decay in a certain way, you see. And it's my observation that makes that, uh, that uh, photon either reflect or transmit. Mm -hmm. So suddenly this observer effect, I'm spreading it out to other phenomena besides just the double slit, which is just uh -huh. makes the whole concept much stronger. Uh -huh. And it, without, you know, there is no way to explain that except by this being an information-based reality. It's a virtual reality. That's the only possible uh -huh. explanation because how, how that particle decays determines on, is determined by the information I have about it before it does it. And so It, it makes it this, an information-based reality. Right. And so what this means for consciousness, I guess, is it supports your top-down, probabilistic, virtual reality view of reality. Exactly. Um, now, it, it, yeah, exactly. Here's kind of the, the logical, uh, uh, what can I say, the logical trail that, yeah. that, make, that why is that important? You know, why is, why is physics really that important to the guy in the street? You know, it's yeah. not, you know, and, and my model all in all, I'm a, I'm a physicist, but it's not the physics part of it that I really think is the important part. It's the love is, you know, love is where we're, what we're trying to become. That's the right. more important part of it. But still. The physics is going to be, I think, the key to these ideas about love being the answer becoming mainstream. Mm -hmm. And that is that in, in the last decade, we went from 
you know, a handful of people thinking virtual reality was a sane idea to where a lot of people think virtual reality is, is the way it is. Yeah. It's a good idea. When I say lots of people, I don't mean, you know, uh, English majors. I mean, physicists. There's a lot of physicists think that this is an information-based reality. Okay, yeah. so that idea is growing and it's growing in physics departments. Okay, eventually, and I'm hoping my experiments will kind of push this process a little bit by making it more obvious that it's true. Eventually, the physicists are going to say, yes, this is a virtual reality. Mm -hmm. We not only think it's a good idea, but all the evidence is pushing us in that direction. It yeah. is a virtual reality. Well, and once that you mean that it's it, that it's that, that it's information based, not you know some nihilistic perspective that you know reality doesn't matter. Or my my exactly, accuracy, you know. it just means it's information based. Yeah, saying that it's information based says that it's computed. Mm -hmm. It's computed according to a rule set. Rules are physics, chemistry, biology. You know, those are the rules. Scientists yeah. try to dig the rules out of the rule set to see how the how the simulation works. So yeah. it's just saying that it's information based. Information based means it's computed. Computed means it's a virtual reality. Yeah. Okay? Virtual realities don't exist just because they want to. You know, they have to have a purpose. They're built. Yeah. Somebody had to put a rule set together and in initial conditions and evolve. You know, this let this let this virtual reality evolve to to what it is, yeah. and all that needed a purpose. So, and of course, the purpose is so that we individuated units of consciousness can grow up and yeah. evolve our quality of consciousness rather than de-evolve. So we have all this going together. And there's this logic train then that says, if this is a virtual reality, okay, then it has to come from someplace else. Virtual realities can't mm. be computed from inside the virtual reality they're computing. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a non-starter. You know, yeah. that, that obviously doesn't work. So if you have a virtual reality, they have to be computed from outside that virtual reality. Okay? If this is an information base, then the, and it's computed. So the computer that's computing it has to be outside the virtual reality. Mm -hmm. Now, virtual reality characters are all avatars. Mm -hmm. They don't really have consciousness. They don't have brains. They don't have livers and hearts. They're just avatars that are computed. They're computed yeah. things. That's the way virtual realities work which means the choice, the consciousness for those players has to also be outside of that physical reality. Can't be inside, has to be outside the physical reality. Uh, just like when you play World of Warcraft, you, the player, are the elf's consciousness. You make all the elf's choices. Mm -hmm. You exist outside of that World of Warcraft reality and you exist in the same reality as the server, as the computer, because the player and the computer have to share data. Yeah. You see, and if you have, if you're sharing data back and forth, you need to be in the same reality. Mm -hmm. So the player and the computer are in the same reality and they are in some other reality yeah. that's non physical from the perspective of the virtual reality. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, all that logic just comes from saying this is a computed reality, this is an information based reality. That means it's computed. Yeah. So if it's computed, then Logic, dot, 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 therefore, you know, you come up with our reality as a subset of something larger. Yeah. That larger thing is the superset. We're the subset. Okay. Then some obvious questions come. Well, what is this larger thing? Yeah. Well, what's going on here? It's the player is just the consciousness. The, you know, the computer is just computing what the consciousness makes the choices. You know, the consciousness says, I want my player to run. Then the computer shows the picture of the player running and computes all the consequences of running because the fact that your player runs creates other possibilities for the other characters, which may do other things based on that. So the computer computes all the consequences and things that the other players do. So what we're going to have is if this is a virtual reality, then we're a subset. If we're a subset, we are not really physical beings. Mm -hmm. We are consciousness playing a physical, you know, a, an avatar in this yeah. virtual reality game. Consciousness is fundamental. Yeah. That's consciousness, like a movie. consciousness is the computer. Yeah. So yes, consciousness is an information system. It configures some of itself as a computer. It configures some of itself 
as individuated units of consciousness like us, mm. and we play this virtual reality game. And why? Because playing these characters in the virtual reality game gives us an opportunity to make choices. Yeah. Important choices with consequences. And by those choices, we evolve or de-evolve. Moral choices come to us here in this virtual reality where outside the virtual reality, without the virtual reality, consciousness just communicates with each other. It's like a big chat room. There's yeah. no, there's hardly any you know, significant choices. There's hardly any significant consequences. It's just a big chat room. So you have to have the virtual reality to create the context in which the consciousness can make meaningful choices to yeah. speed its evolution of growing up and becoming love. So all of that kind of fits together, you see. So when those physicists say, this is a virtual reality, logic will say, then it's a subset of something non-physical that is more significant. Uh -huh. And that subset can't really be anything other than consciousness because that's all it is. The player is nothing more than consciousness for the, for the avatar. Yeah. And consciousness is an information system. So consciousness is also the computer. So that tells you consciousness system and consciousness being a, a um, uh, social system lowers its entropy, evolves through cooperation, caring, being helpful, becoming love, or mm -hmm. it de-evolves through mm -hmm. fear, you know, no trust, me, mine, you know, I want what you got and here, you know, I'm going to take it away from you if I can, that yeah. kind of thing. So that, I think, will become obvious, not immediately, but once scientists get there and claim that this is a virtual reality, you know, I call scientists the high priests of Western culture. <laughs> and I call them that because the high priest job in our culture has always been to tell everybody else what to believe. Mm -hmm. That's what the high priest does. Well, that's the physicist now. It's the scientists to tell everybody else what to believe. Yeah. And when the physicists say it's a virtual reality, it's a virtual reality. Yeah. Anybody else says it, eh, that's interesting, but eh, I don't know. But yeah. when the physicists say it, that takes it mainstream. You see, it finally gets out of the margin into the mainstream. And once that happens, there'll be all sorts of philosophers and other people with, with brains that will look at it and say, well, you know, there's some logical consequences, some, some logical, uh, you know, derivatives from this idea that it's a virtual reality. If virtual, and they'll start ticking down these things, and pretty soon the mm -hmm. idea will be that, hey, this is all about growing up. It's yeah. all about, you know, caring. Yeah. That's what we're here for. That's our mission. Mm -hmm. And I think if that became, oh, even a, a, a reasonably, you know, a reasonably large minority, even a 10 or 20%, yeah. that's all it would take. Because yeah. this world is full of people who are hungry for a better solution, for a better idea how to live our lives and why we're here. Um, ask an, almost anybody in any part of the world whether or not what we have now is working well, and most of them will say, <laughs> no, yeah. it's not working too well. There's so much greed. There's so much dysfunction. There's so much anger. There's so much you know, self-centeredness. It's not working very well. We need something else, but nobody really knows what. Yeah. And you have religions giving some say, well, you know, we have a way, but yes, but it comes with, you know, it comes with a lot of dogma, it comes with belief and things you have to do and give us 10% of your money and a lot of <laughs> other things. It's yeah. not inclusive. You know, it's a club, like a club you have to join. And then there's others that are, that fight, you know, then the clubs all fight with each other and you're right back where you started. Yeah. So this comes is terribly uh, inclusive. Yeah. You see, it, it, everybody can can join this club, and there's no price for admission. There's nothing to believe. There's, uh, you know, it's just open to everybody. And you're an example for that. You know, uh, an atheist and a theist can both find justification for their beliefs in this model. And you yeah. think, well, they are opposite. One believes in God, and the other one doesn't. You know, the atheist and the theist. But the atheist will look at it and say, well, look, there's no God. There's this larger consciousness system and it's not perfect and it's not infinite. It's evolving. It's just trying the best it can to, you know, to, to evolve and stay alive. And it's a perfectly natural system. It's not supernatural. Yeah. And the theist would say, see, I always told you there was a God, this larger <laughs> consciousness system. We yeah. are in its image. We're a piece of conscious, just like it. 
and uh, you know it's all about love, just like we've always said. And you know we uh, and it can just go through all these these attributes of God that are fundamental, and the larger conscious system fills those attributes. You know, I, I had a couple of theologians on the stage with me, in one of the talks I gave, I gave it in a Unity Church, and afterwards, uh, the the pastor and the second assistant pastor both you know, PhDs in theology, uh, sat up on the stage with me and the, the, um, audience was able to ask us all, all questions. That's just what happens. You know, it was one of these things that then they, you know, people make donations and then we split the donation and, and go home. So it was one of those. <laughs> and it was really good because I asked them a question. I said, Hey, I'd like to ask you theologists a question. What are the attributes of God? And, and, you know, unity is a pretty open-minded branch. So they didn't have a lot of dogma. And I told them, I don't want dogma. I don't want that. You know, I want just the fundamental attributes. What makes God God? You know, what is it? So they did. They they huddled together for probably five minutes and they came back and said, okay. And they made a list of about 10 things. And all 10 things were the attributes of the larger consciousness system. So mm -hmm. you see, a theist looks at it and says, see, just like I said, yeah. okay, you know, it's not perfect it's not done it's still evolving but yeah details yeah still the fundamental thing there that that theists find important is there and yeah. the fundamental thing that the atheists find important is it's not this magic supernatural being that you know is playing with its pet people it's just a <laughs> natural system that is evolving and yeah. we're just part of that evolution so you see an atheist and a theist both find a home within this theory. And it yeah. works like that all over. I, yeah. I talk to people and I'm always getting people telling me, uh, like, you know, Tom, I've been studying uh, Tibetan Buddhism for uh, 30 years and you sound just like a Tibetan Buddhist. <laughs> you know, you sound just like a Kabbalist. You sound just like, you know, the, the Hopi Indian. Uh, you sound just like the Australian dream, you know, dreamers yeah. and on Everything. and on and on. Yeah. Yeah, the Aborigines in Australia have this uh, theology of, of we live in a dream. Yeah. You know, they, we have like dreams within, within the dream. Yeah, see, it's a virtual reality. So, yes, you know, I have that all the time. And that's because this idea is just fundamentally a clear, logical set of the fundamentals of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, I don't elaborate on any of it. Yeah. I just let it be that way. And, Everybody, no, no matter what their ism is, can find a place in it that's suitable. Well, that makes it attractive to people who really know we're not doing very well, that the world is a very dysfunctional place, which is pretty obvious if you ever go outside, you know, that that's, that's the case. And what should we be doing and how should we be doing it? Yeah, so well, how should the individual gauge uh, his or her progress in terms of moving towards lower entropy or improving the quality of his or her own consciousness. The way you can gauge your own progress is look at your emotions. Mm. Your emotions live in what I call your being level. They're just you. They are, mm. they are who you are at the core. You don't think about having an emotion and then have the emotion because you thought about it. The emotion just pops out of you because that's what's living inside of you. So look at your emotions. If your emotions are positive, your emotions are all about joy, all about gladness, all about, um, uh, you know, happiness. They're all positive. Then you're doing really well. If your emotions are negative, if they're about anxiety and stress and anger and annoyance and, you know, fear, that sort of thing, then you're not doing very well. Yeah. So you just, you just look at your emotions and see, are they positive or are they negative? And yeah. when you are interacting with people and some negative emotion comes up, maybe you judge somebody. Well, that person's a real jerk. You know, I don't think I'll spend any time talking with her or, or him, you know, da, 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 and you start and you're judging people. Well, that's negative. Yeah. You know, whether it's true or not, isn't the point. Yeah. It's negative. Yeah. It's negative and it's unnecessary. It doesn't help anybody. It's not, it doesn't help you. It doesn't help anybody else. It's a, it's a negative. It's part of the problem, not part yeah. of the solution. So when you find yourself with some negative, you know that it has its source in a fear. Yeah. So you can trace that ego down to a fear. And why do I feel that way? Why do I have to put people down or, or label them or judge them? Mm -hmm. And 
it's because you feel inadequate about yourself and you're always trying to make yourself feel better by making other people look worse. Yeah. You know, and you come up with these various things and they say, well, that's my ego attached to my fear. I need to get rid of that. Yeah. And not that I need to stop doing that. Like my behavior needs to change. Well, behavior changing is nice, but that's not what we're talking about. You have to get rid of it. You have to not be that way rather yeah. than not act that way. Right. So that's the, that's the fundamental thing. So, it's about so, being. See, so see, here we have this overview and it looks like physics because I'm deriving quantum mechanics. I'm deriving relativity from something bigger, which is the toe that Einstein was looking for. He was right. looking for a toe that would explain quantum mechanics and relativity. Well, there it is. Not only that, it explains everything in the subjective world as well as the objective world. Yeah. You want to know why you're unhappy? You want to know why you're stressed? You want to know why, you know, you have illnesses and so on? Why you catch a cold every year? Well, there's usually a reason for it. And it's not just a physical reason. The physical and the mental, the phys you know, the consciousness and the avatar are all intertwined in what happens. Consciousness leads, the body follows. As consciousness is full of stress and problems, then the body tends to express that stress and problems in terms of physical symptoms. Yeah. So everything is intertwined. And if you can understand both the physical and the non-physical, you know, the, the intellectual and, and the, um, what can we say, uh, intuitive, if you can understand both those sides, the, the objective and the subjective, now you can see a whole person. Yeah, And understanding that whole person is so much easier than trying to, you know, to try to understand that person just from one half or one, one subset of what that person is about, like what the avatar is doing. Well, that's what medicine does. They just look at what the avatar is all about and try to decide what's going on. Well, that's only a piece of the, that's only a piece of the puzzle. It's that's not, an interesting way to put it. I, I, I hadn't thought of medicine in those terms before, but that's, yeah. that's a really good way to yeah. put it. Yeah, they're only looking at us, and it's not even the bigger piece of the puzzle. It's the yeah. smaller piece of the puzzle. <laughs> the other two thirds of the puzzle are someplace else, and that's why they can't come. That's why they don't know so much. It's why they can't find the source of things. That's why medicine is primarily symptom relief yeah. rather than you know getting Pause. rid of the cause. Yeah. I mean, sometimes they can get rid of causes. It's not that they can't do that at all, but yeah. a lot of it is just symptom relief because they don't understand the, what the cause is. Yeah. Simple relief through a pill. Yeah. yeah, basically, that's what a lot of it is. That's because they don't understand the whole human being. They're only looking at that piece of a human being. That's the minor piece. Yeah. The bigger piece is on the other side because consciousness is the leader. Yeah. Consciousness has issues, then those issues are represented in a physical body. Yeah. But the source is over there in consciousness. So anyway, this this whole theory then derives science is the big toe that Einstein was looking for, explains quantum mechanics, and hopefully will deliver us by way of the high priests of science coming, you know, declaring this is a virtual reality, will, will lead us to the philosophy that loves the answer. Yeah. Well, this and is an incredibly that's powerful. Just a natural, yeah, and that's just the natural outcome of who we are and where we, where we are. It's not a belief yeah. to have. It's just the way we are. It's science because yeah. the whole thing is just a logical progression. And along the way, it solves the science problems. It solves the physics problems and ends up with a, a philosophical output that says love is the answer. And it's not this is a, a theory or a, a, an idea or something to believe in or follow. It's just a, it's a fact of life. It's the way we are. It's what we're here for. You know, it's, it's nothing to join. It's what we are. So yeah. that's, the, that's kind of the big picture. Well, Tom, thanks a lot for this big picture. Um, hopefully it'll help a lot of folks that are listening or watching to reframe their realities. Um, and, you know, I think your ideas are spreading. And eventually physicists, mainstream physicists, are going to have to start paying attention. Um, but where can folks catch you if they want to go see Tom Campbell live or... Well, there's several places. Um, if they want to see where I'm going to be, where my body, where my avatar is going to yeah. be, then they should go to um, a website called MBT Events, mbtevents.com. And mm -hmm. uh, that's run by Donna and Keith Warner. And they are my organizers and planners, and they know all the dates and where I'm going to be. They're planning all the way out to 2021 already. So, <laughs> you know, that's, that's where all that information is. If they want to 
um, look at my website, and that's mybigtoe.com. I've got a lot of links there to various things. And the biggest place that they can find out my information is to go to YouTube. Yeah, I've got now somewhere between five and six hundred videos there, and unfortunately, many of those videos are like an hour and a half, two hours they're, long. They're kind of intimidating, but uh, <laughs> like this <you> know, one, <laughs> yeah, like this one, this is going to be a little long. But you know, you can't you can't explain a big idea right. in thirty minutes or even yeah. an hour. It's really really hard. Yeah. It's got too many strings attached to it, and to just say the last you know to just hit the a few sound bites you just sound stupid you yeah. just sound like you're making stuff up you know yeah. oh let's all get together and hold hands and life would be a better price you know right. we'll all do better love each other good night send money you know it's, <laughs> you know it just comes off as as uh, you know not credible yeah so it takes the time to develop the ideas and we just now did it about as fast as it could possibly be done you yeah. know to get That's there and there's lots of other things that you know we never got to you know there's lots yeah. of details that are that are there but uh i have to do a second yeah. podcast i have more material but i yeah. still think anyone's gonna keep listening if we go too much longer yeah but that was fascinating that, really yeah that's the problem too yeah. much but anyway there's thousands of hours there Thirty-five thousand, i've heard to be exact <laughs> it could yeah, be something incredible yeah there's thousands yeah. of hours and and it just keeps piling up because every time I do an event or have a discussion like this with somebody, yeah. I put it up there yep. because I want everything to be for free. I don't yep. want to make this available to people who have money and not yep. available to people who don't. I yep. want it to be available to everybody who has an interest. So everything I do, even if it costs people $2,000 to be there, yeah. it's going to be up on YouTube and it's going to be free if you just, you know, wait for the video rather than go to the movie, you know, yeah. you, uh, it uh, it's going to be out there for free sooner or later, anyhow. Cool. And that's so that's why there's so much that's yeah. that's out there. So don't be, I tell you, readers, don't be uh, intimidated by the fact that there's so much. Just pick a place, mm -hmm. and only if you want to only listen at 15 minutes at a time, fine. Yeah. YouTube is great about saving your place. You can come back to it later. <laughs> you know, it, it's not even good to take these things in in too big a bite. Yeah. You know, this hour is going to have a lot of people's minds, you know, puffing up and ready to explode, you know, just listening to what we've talked about this far. Yeah. And you need some weeks, if not some months, to think on this a while and uh, yeah, study or, a while and do a little research. Years. Yeah, of course, there's a book. Now, yeah. the book. The book is on uh, Google Books, so it's also for free. Yeah, check it out. Go, you guys. Huh? Oh, really? It's free now? It's free. Well, it's it always free. has been. The day I published it and put it up on uh, Amazon... Okay. Or no, not Amazon. Yeah, I put it yeah. on Amazon. I put yeah. it on Google Books all in the same week. And yeah. that was, the, you know, like I say, as soon as it was published, it's been on Google Books for free all, right. all along. The downside you guys should pay is, for it if you can, though. Pardon? Yeah. I'm just telling people they should pay for it if they can. I mean, if you can't afford it, by all means, <laughs> yeah. you know. Well, the downside about Google Books, if you sit there and read it on your screen. Yeah. You know, that's you not I mean, good. This book, you have to be able to highlight. You have to be able to dog ear. You, you have yeah. to think about it. There's also yeah. an audiobook version. Yeah. So you can buy it on uh, on audible.com. All right. And uh, so that's where your readers should go if they're interested in finding out more of the details. Well, Tom, thanks so, thanks so much for doing this. Thanks for doing what you do. Um, if you guys like this, please share it up. Give us a like. Leave a comment. We'll try to get back to you. Um, thanks very much. Tom, appreciate it. Garrett, thank you very much for inviting me. Pleasure.